God's man, man of action, man of intellect, man of emotion, and man of spirit. I've got a fantastic guest here. I've got another great guest too. And uh, I'm going to tell you about both of them. But um, this guest, uh, just really honored that he's on here today. And um, I would say he's the epitome of a warrior. He's, I'm sure he's heard that a lot. But I'm going to let you get familiar with uh, who he is and what he's done and what he's doing right now. And um, today's show is basically talking about what makes a warrior, what breaks a warrior, and what builds them back together again. So just like Humpty Dumpty. Um, I'm going to introduce here Tom Satterley. So Tom is uh, basically one of the senior non-commissioned off officers of Delta Force. Uh, he was the command sergeant major of USASOC. Uh, had a 24-year career in the uh, United States Army, four years as a combat engineer and 20 in Delta Force, what we know uh, on TV, most of us as the unit or just uh, anywhere in um, military movies. But he knows a lot about it, a lot he can talk about, a lot he can't, but uh, he's going to talk about a lot of other things that um, some people are not comfortable talking about. And he's doing a lot of great stuff. Um, so I'm going to let him introduce himself, and I'm also going to bring in Brian with Operation RSF. Brian hooked me up with Tom, and Brian runs uh, Operation RSF Group, which is a foundation that helps people get back into uh, the real world after being out of it so long uh, from PTS, PTSD, TBI, or anything else. So um, welcome, guys. Tom, uh, Brian, how are you? Hey, great. Thanks for having us, Mike. Hey, Brian, how are you? Hey, Tom, good to see you again. And Mike, thank you for having us both on. You're welcome. So, Tom, <clears throat> I've got a lot of questions. And um, so give us a quick rundown, maybe three to five minutes of um, your background, if you can, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go further from there. Yeah, uh, like you said, I, I spent 25 years in the Army after joining for college money, you know, four years in and out, get some money and on my way, right? And, uh, you know, that those first three years in Germany were pretty cool for me. It was it was one of those, I saw the boring regular Army side. Yep, I'm getting out in four years, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the civilian world. And then I got a taste of special operations while I was in Germany. You know, I got to go to um, platoon confidence training, German Ranger School, French Commando School. And so I was like, I like this. So I'm going to go find this. And, you know, re-enlisted four to six years at a time, whatever, and just, oh, I'm going to go SF. And I went SF. And then as soon as I was in language school, some guys approached me like, hey, you want to go to the unit? I'm like, sure, I'll do that. And so I just kept going until, you know, I found myself in the unit one day. And, uh, and man, I'll tell you what, that's that fast moving train everybody talks about and you grab a hold of it and it rips you off the ground and you, you're flying and I was just hanging on to that thing the whole time and then 20 years later let go of it and just I think I just after 10 years of retirement just stopped tumbling from jumping off that train probably um, is the analogy I would use for how long it probably takes to get over what you did get past what you did um, you know, my first combat mission was in Somalia in 1993, so that was the that was a launching pad for me for the rest of my 18 years in the unit. Was was thrust into loss of life, PTSD. Um, don't talk about it. Only work harder. Get your nose down and don't say shit about what's bothering you, and just keep busy. And oh, by the way, here's some young kids coming at your heels trying to take your job from you. So. That 25 years of stress and pressure of trying to be good enough and trying to keep those young kids off your heels. And then that one day, and I'll never forget that one day where I had to take something out of my rucksack to not slow my team down so we could win. And, you know, out of 20 years in the unit, that's one day that rings clear to me is the day that those young kids surpassed me in my ability to keep up with them. And I'll never forget that day. And I, I bet from that day on, was the slide into my my next career which is helping as many active duty veteran service members that i can get over this stigma of not asking for help and getting over the traumas of of being in the military and and what all that brings with it so i hope that was exactly three to five minutes <laughs> yeah, a little bit over that's cool man <laughs> hey brian um so tell me uh you know uh, tell tell our listeners about your your group and what you do yeah, man. So uh, I got hooked up with Operation RSF uh, last year, uh, really when the shutdown happened, we weren't going into work every day. I was really just looking for ways to uh, really give back more so than what I was just doing you know, on my day to day life on active duty. So I found Operation RSF, which was also born in the Special Forces community. 
Um, really what Operation RSF was doing was helping people find a renewed sense of purpose and community after service by getting them connected through their fitness communities. Um, and then Tyler, who is our co-founder, what he and I found also from our standpoint was it was really important for guys that were still in the team room to be having these discussions and really starting to set uh, the example of saying like, hey, we're more than just, you know, warriors in the traditional sense. And we're going to get more into that later. Um, but, you know, there are certain conversations that we can have in certain ways that we take care of our teammates. Uh, that I think go a long way when you see people that are still living that everyday team life uh, acting upon. So, you know, so we see that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And that's that big triangle. We see it in school and everything. You know, they talk about physiological needs, you know, safety needs. You got your, I think it's the love and belonging. And then you've got way at the top is self-actualization. And so, you know, you get your food, your air, your water, you got your personal uh, stuff, your safety, you get your, uh, your, your, your connections and your, your, your brotherhood and stuff like that. And we, we get up to this tier, which is the top, is to figure out what we are and how we serve. So, Tom, you know, I read an interesting story, which was you went to a John Cougar Mellon Camp concert. And I mean, what was the decision to join? I mean, was it something where a lot of young guys say, man, I want to be a badass. I want to go in the military. Or they say, you know, I just want to get college out of the way. Or, or what was the thought for you? Was it I want to be a warrior, or was that, or is it, I mean, or is it part and parcel, all, all of it? I never ever considered myself a warrior. I mean, I got beat up growing up, man, and uh, until I fought back one day. But I, I never considered myself a warrior. I never considered the military. I literally made fun of my brother for joining, and I uh, picked on him for years. Um, I. It was one of those moments in life where I took it as an opportunity to get further than I was ever going to get, right? Like, oh, my friend came back from basic training. I'm going to Germany. I'm like, I would never even think about going to Germany. And, I, and, I, and it hit me. I thought, I could grow up my entire life and never leave this state, you know? So I seized that opportunity to get out of town, basically, and to do something else and force myself into something that I probably would have never done. So, I mean, how would you define a warrior? Because we think of it today. And I, I know a lot of people overuse that term and said, you know, he fought cancer like a warrior or something. But to me, I mean, a warrior is someone who is principled. They have values. They uh, have a belief system and they combat something or fight something. Then they know why they should have those principles. So they go into battle and they come back and say, nah, I know why I'm not a fighter. I'm, I'm this guy with these principles. So, I mean, for you, I know you're saying that you never thought of yourself as one. And I would say, no, you are definitely to me. I mean, you're, you're a role model, an idol. Um, but at the same time, um, how, would, how would you define it in your own terms for other people, you know, who look up to you and, and want to be see, see an example um, in, in themselves, be an example in themselves? You know, a lot of us, I, and I used to say, we all know what's right and wrong, right? But we, we don't, right? We know what our version of right is, right? And on the other side of the world, their version of right is something completely different from our version of right. So, you know, I stopped that. We all know what's right um, and wrong because some mm -hmm. some don't. I think a warrior is an individual who operates within, I don't know, we'll say an entity, an organization, anything. Um, or you can be an individual warrior, but what is that? What is a rogue warrior, right? And that's a whole other term of, of somebody that goes off and does their own thing. But, you know, a well-trained, and I like to talk about that. You have to be trained. You're not born a warrior. Everybody likes, I was born a warrior, really. You were born a human with nothing until you were taught something you were given ideas you were given everything that we have in our in our in ourselves we were taught or or we, we you know we saw it and witnessed it and so to be a warrior is to be highly trained to, and and to practice that craft repeatedly and and never ceasing and conducting those missions and doing those things that are legally morally and ethically right Right. Every time we get off that path, that's when everything goes awry. That's when, you know, the lies start, the cover up starts. It's, they say it's never the lie, it's the cover up. But, you know, if you stay within that, that, that realm of training that you've been given and you practice that craft and do the best that you can and you, you do what's legally, morally and ethically right within that, when given the opportunity to do so, that's a warrior. People on the football field, people in baseball, he's, he's going to battle, he's doing this. We all like to use those those phrases, but if you look at what each person is talking about, they're talking about doing the very best they can with what they've been taught and trained along the way to go against, you know, competition, someone else who's been trained at their craft and come out ahead. 
you know, and to be a warrior, you don't have to come out ahead, do you? I mean, many warriors I know have died. So it's just exercising that craft as long as you can and to help those to your left and right. So you um, you uh, became a combat engineer and went to Germany. And then you, you know, got an opportunity to go ahead and train for selection and then uh, get selected. So, I mean, how did that work for you? Um, getting in there and then you realize this is pretty serious. This is tougher than I thought, or was it, you know, an easy transition for you? And was it something that really winded you when you got in there for selection? Physically, it was easy. Yeah. Physically for me, I was ready. Um, mm -hmm. Almost cocky. I mean, I read my, my selection reports from the cadre and it was like, this individual was very cocky, you know? And I'm like, and I, yeah, I was, man, I was a young kid. I was full of testosterone. I was physically fit. I had never failed anything. Right. So I was hiding it all. I had just complete and utter fear, fear of failing everything. Mm. I mean, I would vomit the night before selections would start. Just any kind of course would start. I'm like, Ugh, so sick of wanting to be perfect that it would destroy me. But I had no plans in life, man. I never had a plan. I just bettered myself with whatever opportunity presented itself to me. Um, you know, I, I, I never thought about being a green bread. You know, I didn't even think about being a combat engineer. I went in to be... A medic you know something in the medical field i had no clue and um the recruiter said oh you like to blow stuff up and build stuff yeah sure everybody likes to blow stuff up there i was meeting a quota became a combat engineer liked it but you know it was kind of boring you don't get to do much in the regular army and then i saw a picture of my friend holding you know his he was a baby wearing a green beret his father's green beret and he's like that's his dream I'm like that's my dream man I, that looks cool i want to be a green beret and it just kept going, something better, you know, always wanting to better myself. I never had a plan. Mm -hmm. I, I never had a warrior mentality. Um, you know, like, I'm going to go crush the enemy. I just never considered that, th that, that stuff until, until I was in it. And now I made the selection. Now I'm in the training. Now I'm going to keep doing the best that I can at whatever they bring to me until I was aware you know, probably past 23, 25, I'm, I'm really no longer a child. My brain's actually starting to learn some things now. And I started studying more and becoming more aware and, and, and better at my own craft versus waiting to be taught something. You know, they get us as kids at a young age. We're very, very moldable. We're, we're not even finished growing, you know, maturing mentally in our brains. And, and so that really shapes a person's life, you know, basic training in the military at such a young age. And I think that that 24, 25 era of getting over that, yeah, I'm going to start teaching myself now this craft. That's when I started to really enjoy what I was doing and started to focus on, wow, I'm really here. I'm really in something that I need to be very, very good at instead of just I'll do what they teach me, you know, tell me what to do and I'll do it. That was always easy for me. So we, you know, we've read the book, uh, Black Hawk Down. A lot of us, uh, we've seen the movie and that happened in 93. You know, we're fast forward. It's 2021 now going in there. And, um, you know, Brian, I know you, you, you know, read his book too. It's just amazing, incredible stuff there. Um, yeah. And I, Tom, you know, not to just keep flattering you because that's not my goal, <clears> but <throat> I watch a couple of podcasts and I realized how succinctly you put things and, um, you know, you really uh, understand a lot that most of us can't. But going in Mogadishu, I mean, uh, how old were you then at that time? And was there a point um, that you realized, you know, you're in it and this is this is for real and this is what you want to do? Is that something that you knew or you never sank in? You know, I was 26, 25, I think when we rolled into Somalia. And I mean, that's not what I thought combat was, right? I mean, you think combat's like you just shoot the bad guys, you come back and high five. And we always told stories. The first five missions were what I thought combat was. You know, there's some shots fired. It was scary. I felt like a badass. And um, we all told stories. You see that guy do this and that, you know? And and then 3 October was a lot of death, um, a lot of terrifying. I mean, if you're stuck somewhere and the bad guys won't let you out, matter of fact, they're coming in to kill you and you start to realize that. You know, as a 24-year-old, 25-year-old kid, I started to believe, and I did believe that day, that night, that I, I was dead. You know, like I knew I was dead. And I just made that mental um, mental switch to, 
I'm going to take as many of you with me as I can, you know, and hopefully some of these guys make it out of here. But I just knew I wasn't going to make it that day. So that was a switch for me. And from that day on, I, I probably had zero empathy, zero compassion. And I blamed everyone else for their misery, you know, like, hey, you can always train harder. You can always do more and it'll make it better. And that that was the rest of my life. Um, well, the rest of my career there. And that's what destroyed me. The the continuous. I got to be better. I'm not good enough. Um, I might die if I don't you know, if I don't know exactly how to do all this stuff perfectly. So I just continued and continued and continued. And all I focused on was my job. And when that's all you look at, everything else got left behind, you know, three, three other marriages, a son that I don't talk to. So that's when I made that dive in of I'm all in. There's nothing else on this planet except my job. And I'm going to be the best at it, you know, but all, all, oh, by the way, I'll never feel good enough along the way. Interesting. So what was it for you that made you, you know, more capable? Was it mindset? Was it? skills was it experience was it all three was it something else yeah you know i talk a lot about um you know you can be taught something you can have the experience of something and then you can have that mindset right and if you don't have all three you're just you're missing something you, you know you're kind of missing something along the way but where do you get the experience right <laughs> you can go through training all you want so you do the realistic training in special operations and things like that you know i mean so the regular army you go to the range and shoot once a year and you're qualified and that's training um and you get your three bullets you know and then you're done and, uh, and it's very expensive right to train that many people so that's why special operations is so much smaller harder to find the people and they you know it just if everybody got trained that well, right? It just, you, I don't think there's enough money on the planet to train that, that many people that well and run that many people through selection, but it, it's difficult to, and this is the part where I start to battle because I forget where I was running with that, but it, it's, it's hard to say in the special operations community um, that you need that help, right? You need that help. We attach everything to that um, mentality and that that culture of what we all think a warrior is. Oh, I can never be touched. I can never be hurt and injured. I'm always strong. I'm acting tough all the time. You know, we're cussing. We're whatever that visual cigarette hanging out of your mouth. You got a drink in your hand and he's tough and he's got a huge bicep. And that mentality affects us all, doesn't it? It, it, it affected me that I tried to be that person for 25 years, that person I never was, trying to be somebody I never was from birth. And then everything, everything that I had, you know, I just had to keep going for more. I just always wanted to learn more. So I'll stop with that. <laughs> instead well, of yeah. No, no, that's a, that's a good segue. So, I mean, you know, a lot of people separate and Brian, you know, you deal with guys who do this and I know Tom as mm -hmm. well, they separate and then they have this, um, you know, <clears throat> man can only find meaning for his existence outside of himself. You know, if he finds it himself, he's, he's going to be lost in the sauce, man. And so you have to have something outwardly that you, you, you pull onto, you know, some type of anchor. Right. But, um, was it a trigger? You know, was it PTS, TBI? Was it a trigger or a loss of friends, marriages, or was it a culmination of things? I mean, is there something that stuck out in your mind that you knew that, um, your life was never going to be the same as it was before? You know, where the temple was really good and you were enjoying what you were doing. When did it become uh, unpleasurable? You know, I think it became, I think it all happened for me in Somalia. Mm -hmm. I don't think I knew what that was until I was retired for about five years. And I, and I think it happened slowly. The awareness, and, and it's when I met Jen, um, my wife now, that I was just on autopilot for everything I did, right? Wife number one, see ya. Wife number two, later. Wife number three, hard, definitely harder. It was after retirement. I had, a, I had a son with her. Still, you know, hey, I'm, I'm too strong to worry about stuff like that. <clears throat> but I was, I was an ass, right? I prided myself in being fair and tough. And then until I met Jen, until I started seeing what life really could be, that's when I look back and realize all the things I was doing was all a lie, right? It was all fake. It was all a cover-up. Um, 
to, to look stronger. Mm-hmm. And when you wear a mask for that many years, you know, I mean, you, you guys know it, right? Whenever you try to cover up and fake and hide something, man, that's what destroys you. Um, every lie along the way destroyed me more. So I think I, I, I think I look back now and, and I know the day, but when it happened, I didn't know when it happened. I didn't know that I was living that way and in it because of the culture. You look around and you say, what, what, what is PTSD? Oh, risky behavior, this and that, and all the things that we as a military culture do on a daily basis. To us, that's normal everyday living until you step outside and look back in it or have that self-awareness, which is what we talk about a lot is like the self-awareness instead of blaming everyone else for what's going on with you, have that self-awareness of how you're feeling, what caused you to feel that way. And Oh, by the way, what do I do about it to behave the way that I want to behave? So I had to look back years later and say, okay, I think it was Somalia when it hit me, when I had zero compassion and empathy and I didn't gain it again until I, I was down in the dump so far that I needed help and, and it was so easy to help me that I realized, wow, I could do this for other people, you know, that, and if I just cared a little bit and realized that people need a hand and, and, and that's when it all started coming back for me. So somewhere in the middle, I was lost along the way, stumbling around and didn't know what I was doing. Um, but looking back on it, I can kind of pinpoint those days mm-hmm. and years when, when I changed from normal to, you know, occupational stress injury buried in my own life and then climbing back out, I can see it now. Yeah, hey, Tom, you mentioned awareness and it's something I wrote down, but particularly within soft, we have a really high premium on being aware, whether that's situationally aware to survive in combat or abiding by the soft truth of being aware enough to understand whatever operational environment you're in. Uh, but we haven't placed a large emphasis on being aware enough to understand when there's something that you can't handle on your own. I think that was a key point that you were making earlier. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> we hear the word vulnerability and we're like, don't. Don't, don't, we're not vulnerable. Don't talk about vulnerability. I think uh, JSOC brought in Brene Brown one time. She talks about vulnerability. And I think Tony Thomas was like, don't, don't mention vulnerability. Don't talk about vulnerability. So they, she starts to come out on the stage like, hey, listen, they don't want you to talk about vulnerability. She's like, okay, I got it. She walks out and she's like, hey, I'm here today to talk about vulnerability, right? So they're like, we're not vulnerable. We're special ops. And I, and I want to bring their awareness to this that if you don't become vulnerable, you can't do anything courageous right? There's nothing, nothing courageous about doing anything that doesn't make you vulnerable. So it's that reality and that that fake speak that we tell ourselves that your thoughts become your words, become your actions. You hear it so long, you know, you're stuck, you're tough, you're strong, you don't need help or figure it out on your own. And, And when it comes to figuring out what the problem is for ourselves, we're good at fixing problems or removing them. And if we can't fix them, we remove them. And if it's ourselves, sadly, that's I, I see where guys get to the point over and over again of, man, I'm sorry. And then they go do it again. Oh, man, I'm sorry. And they do it again. I'm sorry. And then that shame builds up to the point of, I can't say I'm sorry anymore. I can't go back and apologize. I'm just going to end my own life because it's less embarrassing than going back and apologizing again or, or admitting something that I've done. So we have to bring that self-awareness of this is me telling myself this because, you know, I'm embarrassed and it's hard to make those calls and it's hard to, it's hard to do those things. So if we're self-aware, you know, then we don't take our lives, right? The people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, the ones that survived, um, there's a group of people that survived to a person. Every one of them regretted it the minute their hand left the rail. So all the way down, they regretted it. And I think I can't help but think of all the successful suicides that if they were given the opportunity, wouldn't have done it. You know, they had that opportunity to pull back from it would. So, you know, I'm kicking myself because um I should have asked you to have your wife come on because she is very insightful. Uh, and so I'm like, why did I not have her on here? And so, you know, we're, let's, let's, um, let's get back to that in just a minute. We're going to go to our sponsor right now and stand by and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and answer a couple of questions. Uh, All right, guys, check out vogstore.com. 
vogstore.com, vogstore.com. So, you know, Tom, um, I'm kicking myself. I should have had Jen come on because she had a lot of insight. She says a lot of really smart things. Um, and she definitely has uh, a perception that I think a lot of us do need. But is that something that a, that a man needs, uh, you know, a soldier, a warrior, uh, which is a female perspective? Or is that something that he can achieve on his own, which is to get pulled back together again, you know? Um, because a lot of being a soldier is denying what the body, the spirit wants in order to get something else, right? We harden the mind, we harden the spirit, um, we even harden the emotions, and then we have this female element. Is that something that's necessary to get put back together again? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that females are taught differently growing up, so they have a different perspective on a lot of stuff, and, and men are like, rub dirt on it, and boys don't cry, you know, and... <laughs> And when you get to a, a part in your life where rubbing dirt on it doesn't work and, and, and sucking it up doesn't make it feel better and sticking a gun to your head in an argument and banging it up against your forehead and it's so mad and you, and, you know, you put it down and you're like, what was I doing? Who was that person? It's time to realize we need a different perspective, whether it's a therapist, a female, anything. Um, all those things we resist because we're afraid of, them, you know. That's what I want that self-awareness to be is we're afraid of those things we don't understand and we resist them because we don't understand them. Yeah, and I I want people to be more curious and less judgmental, right? And when we do that, we learn so much more. And then we, when we learn more, we realize, oh, I wasn't trapped. There are other ways out. I, I'm not in such a small place. This is a huge plan. There's so much more out there to, to understand and, and figure out. And the more we know, the more we understand. And I think that a lot of us that, that were in the military came from smaller backgrounds and, and, and less less chance and opportunity in life, right? And, and, and so we need to open up and learn with curiosity then and less judgment. And I see, I see a lot of judgment these days. You know, you, whoa, well, yeah, but you, and oh, wait a minute, but you versus, so what are you doing that for again and why? Oh, that's a cool idea. How about, let me hear your idea now, you know, and then back and forth. And then we learn and grow. But uh, sadly, we're in a, we're in a different uh, cycle right now. We need to turn everything inward and learn more about ourselves because we can't fix other people anyway. We can only fix ourselves. So we might as well learn about ourselves. Yeah, I had a buddy who's... Uh girlfriend broke up with him and his other buddy said, you know, screw her, you know, let's go get drunk and let's just uh, do this. And, you know, it got him into a deeper and darker spiral where he got back into drugs and alcoholism. Um, but, you know, your your story is very unique, very interesting. Um, and can you tell us about it? I mean, it had to do with a phone call or a text that you got with your your now wife, Jen, and, and how did that play out? And what was, was that, uh, well, what was, the, what was the event? And did that give you some insight to change, to, to come back out of the darkness. Yeah. You know, what I learned that day was how easy it is to help somebody. Right. And all it takes is a little bit of awareness. You know, I was with two other good friends of mine that day and we were in Ohio and we were just training and Jen was video and she was just part of a camera team. And I barely knew her. I mean, she barely knew me. We were, we were just working together and, and spoke infrequently and my friends in the back seat, you know, and I just had one of those days where I'm just, kind of down, probably hung over, didn't feel good. It's probably a hard day. And, you know, I started thinking about my son, how, who wasn't speaking to me much. And, you know, my wife, who I was divorcing and, uh, and driving back, it was, it was a couple of blocks, I think to our hotel. And it just, it's one of those hit me, you know? So I learned that day, how quick it is, how quick that, that thought process of I'm done. And if I have access to being done, you know, then how quick people can end their lives. I had to finish that two block drive and parked in the parking garage and, and my two buddies jump out the back. They're going to hit the bar, you know, and I, normally I would jump out and run right down with them. And, and Jen was climbing out of the car as well. And she's like, hey, are you coming? Cause I, I normally would have. And she noticed that I was sitting in the car. I, like, I got to make a phone call kind of deal. And she noticed something, you know, cause she wasn't part of my tight knit group who was all part of the culture who didn't notice because I mean, we we're all doing the same things. And, I, you know, I just kept making excuses. And so she takes off. I pull out my pistol, put around it, and I'm just, I'm thinking of, you know, I feel sorry for the rental car company and blah, blah, blah. And do, I, do I put it in the side of my head or my mouth? You know, because I'm OCD and clean. So those things go through your head like, it's going to make a mess, man. And um, it's embarrassing. Like, who's going to see me like this, you know? 
and my phone starts vibrating, 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 you know, and I finally pick it up and there's a bunch of messages, but I saw you're late. And I immediately cleared my weapon, put it away. And I, I'm never late. And I took off and went down to the lobby and, and um, she's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, and I was on a call and ended up sitting in a corner talking, you know, some deep conversation that night about life. But I didn't tell her for a couple of months. Um, I think it was a couple months later, we we're talking and, and we were getting closer and closer. And I said, you know what? I wanted to share something with you. But remember that night in Ohio when I was in the car, blah, blah, blah. She's like, yeah, I, was, I almost shot myself that, you know, that day. I was pretty much done. And that's the day I realized how easy it was to stop me from a habit or a pattern that I was getting ready to roll into of, I'm no good. It'd be better if I wasn't here. I'm just in the way. You know, it wasn't like poor me or anything. It was just like, I've done my thing that I was meant to do on this earth. I can't see anything in the future that I could even contribute to so i'm just in the way and uh and she noticed that and she stopped it and it was it was easy you know i learned how easy it was to to be over with my life i saw how easy it was to help somebody you know and i started paying attention to that and i wasn't rock bottom then but that's when i started to kick a little to try not to hit the bottom and uh that's when i started gaining some more empathy towards other people and, and how easy it is to help someone if you just pay attention. You know, the uh, writer Victor Frankl said, basically there has to be some kind of, you know, meaning in suffering and suffering is, you know, uh, not something that is separate from life or death. It has to coexist with life and death. And so we have to find some meaning in that. I mean, Brian, you know, what's a common thread that you're finding with the guys who come to you that you, you are you reaching out to other people? Um, wh what's, what's happening over there? You know, is there a, displacement from separation? Is it um, combat stress? You know, what, what's going on with the guys that you encounter? Oh, you're muted. Yep, you're muted. I'm muted, my bad. <laughs> it's all good. I'll, I'll splice that out. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the people that have sent us messages have just felt like they don't have that sense of purpose anymore. Um, they must, they, they at once felt like they were doing great in their job, felt like they had uh, a lot of things going on in their life that were that were purposeful. Uh, but whether that's after sustaining some sort of injury that results in uh, med board from the military, uh, talk to a lot of first responders that are no longer um, you know, out there with the boys uh, per se and are maybe working a more sedentary job or have just uh, left their job and are settling into retirement. Um, but I think once you get that, uh, like a perceived sense of society or community, and that's taken away from you, then a lot of the issues that you may have been strong enough to deal with earlier start to manifest in themselves. So Tom, for you, I mean, what was the culmination of things or was it separate things that brought you back to life? Um, you know, you're, you're so involved in so many things. The also care foundation, you are reaching out to people with your, um, your wife, you guys are doing some amazing stuff. So, you know, what was it with health, fitness, nutrition, um, you know, writing a book, was, was that helpful or was that painful? Wow, that was so helpful. It was mm -hmm. painful to get me to do it. <laughs> it, was, it was helpful when I finally did it. Um, and, you know, it was everything that you mentioned. You know, I started off after ruining my, my wedding night with Jen. Um, that Monday, I was in anger management therapy. And that was like step one. It was, it was, it was one of those either go get help or we'll get an annulment. And I was like, wow, this one lasted a long time. Um, so I, I, I did a, I did a self-awareness check finally versus no, 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 I promise. I swear I'm this time. I mean it. And I really mean it this time, you know, to crying and swearing and really meaning it to really meaning it, you know? And I really looked inward and I was like, you know, to be honest, when I started, it was it was also to save my ass and my marriage. And it still wasn't just about me. It was about other things. And it was probably not about looking stupid. And it took a little more time. But anger management, I went to that and I, and I found out, no, you have PTSD, you know, after. And I was like, what? What's that? You know? And, uh, oh, this is what you get when you go to battle. I go, the hell I have PTSD. All right. So, and then, I, you know, I go to the VA doc at some point after that. And she tells me you don't have PTSD because these questions I asked you, one of them was, would you go back? And I'm like, do I want to go back? No. Would I? Sure. You know, that's, that's what I was trained to do. If they asked me, I'd go back. So she said, you don't have PTSD. So this whole time I'm, I'm, I'm 
fighting the fact that I even have it. And I'm just thinking maybe I have anger management problems. So did one therapy, found out that was that. And then do another therapy, um, you know, meditation, transcendental meditation. And then my wife's going to health coaching school, so I'm learning what to eat again, you know, because, you know, you start eating at a gas station, doing contract work, and you're not eating right, so your brain's not firing right because you're putting crap into your whole gut. So doing all of those things, there I start losing weight so I don't feel as bad about myself again. I get back into working out. I'm back to doing the things I should have been doing, living healthy, eating healthy. I'll start to feel a little better, and then I, then I could get to work focusing on what was wrong with me internally. You know, I was physically right. I'm mentally thinking a little better. Now I'm more ready to answer questions and, and go to therapy and talk about what we do now with, with emotional focus therapy, where it's not talk therapy. Um, I didn't get a lot out of that. So we switched and we found a different types. Once we got into EFT, emotionally focused therapy, that worked for me so well, we started using it and it worked well for so many other people. We hired that therapist into our foundation. But Man, it was a, it was all of those things, and I, I'm still I'm gonna go get um, a Stella ganglion block shot coming up in another month. I mean, I'm I continually try new things. I did trans transcranial um, TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation. That that was for eight weeks. I mean, I'm always trying something else to keep going because I'll get those feelings of not good enough, or I'll get those feelings of anger, or I'm I'm just not behaving properly. It's like okay, it's time to get back on something and go back to working on those tools that I've been given before. But it's not one of those pills and you're done. It's not one, one therapy and you're done and you're good for life. Um, I tell people, don't wait till your, your relationships in the tank to go get help. Don't wait till you're so screwed up that you need six doctors to help you, you know, go like the old army magazines, PMCS, you know, you get that, that old cartoon soldier standing there, you know, you work on that vehicle before it breaks to keep it from breaking. I'm like, why won't we do that with our own, our own bodies and our own minds and our relationships? Yeah. And Tom, you mentioned kind of the process as well and how you started off and, and where you're at now. And I think one area where what we're doing at Operation RSF and what you and Jen are doing at All Secure really complement themselves is that we're not necessarily saying that physical fitness is something that is a cure all for post-traumatic stress, depression, and anxiety. Um, but unless that you have that that those aspects of fitness in your life, then a lot of the things you're dealing with can really compound in themselves. So if you are staying healthy, you're eating nutrient dense food, you're getting good sleep quality because of how you're treating your body during the day, then there's a better chance that you're not doing things like drinking at night to help fall asleep uh, or just waking up feeling like crap every morning because you know, we're, we're not eating correctly and we're not um going to the gym, running, getting cardio and things like that. Uh, so that's really where we try to step in is try to help build that initial, I guess, infrastructure, so to speak, or uh, habits that might help somebody start thinking more clearly, have better mental acuity where they can say, hey, this is making me feel better. I know it. Now I want to take these next steps towards treatment. You see that uh, it's kind of like the environment of, you know, the soldiers is iron sharpens iron. But at the same time, it seems that Iron is degrading iron in, in some sense, you know? So are guys, are you guys making progress? Do you see that, that you know, that there's less stigma? Because uh, we've been, you know, at war for about 20 years. Do you see some type of progression and do you see a light at the end of the tunnel for other people? And um, wh what does that look like, Brian? I think we're starting to see it. And, and Tom, jump in anywhere you want to. But I, I think that there is now becoming more of an emphasis from leaders um, to say like, hey, this is a very real thing. Like just because we, we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not real. Um, and I, I think where you're specifically with the military is that we have to defeat not just the stigma of getting treatment, but also the stigma around, hey, if I do go get treatment, am I gonna be, am I gonna have my security clearance taken away from me? Am I gonna be banned from going to X, Y, and Z for schools? Because I mean, that's still a, uh, a popular, rumor that goes around the military that if you do any of that, then you're automatically banned and your career is over. Um, so I think just having people become examples, like I remember hearing one story of uh, CSM and I forget which unit uh, he was from, but he would go to behavioral health every couple weeks or so. And it's not necessarily that he needed it, but he wanted his soldiers to see him doing so. And I think it's things like that that are really gonna help start pushing us the correct way down the road 
as far as breaking the stigma associated with seeking treatment, at least from the military perspective. That's exactly it. And that's what we're seeing now too. Um, we're literally been asked to go back and speak to um, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center School, the entire organization, students, the kids that come in off the street, the ones retire, you know, graduating and moving on. So twice a year, we're going to be talking to all them. We're hitting them at the bottom, at the top, in the middle. We're talking to all the cadre. And the cadre and the commanders are standing up saying, it's okay. I go get help. I want you to guys go get help. And you won't get in trouble for it. They're saying it in a room full of 600 soldiers at a time. We just got back from 19th group in Utah. You know, leaders convention, every gymnasium full of leaders spread out across the United States saying the same thing. We're telling the same story. And we're bringing the awareness of... Um, Hey, what's your training budget? Oh, two million. What are your POTA funds? Zero. Oh, okay. So how many people have been killed, you know, combat related deaths since 9-11? Oh, about 5,600, whatever. Don't quote me on these numbers, right? <laughs> it's around 5,600. How many suicide deaths in, amount of, in the same amount of time? About 68,000. I go, so what's the greatest threat to the U.S. service member? It's our inability to deal with our emotions. It's not the enemy. We're kicking their ass. They can't kill us in the amount of numbers we're killing ourselves. So they're looking at these numbers and they're like, oh, well, maybe we need more POTA funds. Maybe we need to. And I tell them, I go, listen, you guys can find the money for the things you really want. We've always found the money, right, to buy the things we needed. We moved it from here to there. Well, we can't. Uh, we can't when we don't really want to. If it's a problem, and it is, we do it. And people are starting to see it. Command is starting to admit it and raise their hands. So the generation that's coming in are more in touch with their feelings already. Mm -hmm. So they're already more open to it. We're seeing the younger generation more open to talking about it. The old, the older generation is on the way out the door. Guys like me rub dirt on it. Shut up. You know, they're, they're, they're either heading out the door, starting to understand it. And then all that group in the middle that we're hitting are all starting to warm into that big hug thing and saying, it's okay. I mean, if you go to the gym to get bigger muscles and you can run around the track to run faster and you can, Go to the range and tweak your weapon so you shoot better. Why won't we go work on our mental capacity? It just makes us a better warrior. Or you take a PT test to gauge your physical fitness. Why is sitting down with behavioral health right after that engaging your mental fitness any different? Right. Stigma. It's what we've been taught. So we got to get past the old school thing of, you know, rub dirt on it and boys don't cry. You know, I ball my eyes out these days. I watch a home improvement show and they'll do the big reveal. And I'm like, oh, I'm so happy for these people. And I thought, man, I can't tell anybody about this ever. And then um, I got people calling me. Hey, man, I'm very emotional, blah, 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 these days. on Like shows on TV and I go, welcome to the club, man. It, it feels good to feel something. Yeah, there's a fantastic quote that says, between stimulus and response, there's a space between that stimulus and response. And that is where in that response lies our growth and freedom. And so how do you... What advice do you give to someone, Brian first and then Tom, the top three things you would tell someone who has decided that they want to get back into the fold, that they, they, they want to heal? What, what would you tell someone? I think the first thing I would tell somebody is to get connected. You don't want to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, everyone needs a support structure, whether that's your wife, a community that you're a part of, everyone needs a support. Um, and yeah, Tom, you really mentioned it earlier. You hit the nail on the head with just being vulnerable. Um, I think a lot of people that they they don't necessarily want to get help because they don't want to admit to themselves in the first time that they're any different or that they could have a problem. And I think just being vulnerable enough to be honest with yourself and say, hey, I struggle with this and it is beyond my control is a major step forward. I think that's something that holds a lot of people back from getting the help that they need. Yeah, I tell you, safety, security, attachment, connection, right? We need it. We need it, and we need it all the time when we start to break down. Talk about staying connected while deployed, right? Letters, communicate. Guys like, I can't communicate because I'm busy. Come on, man. I was there. I know the deal, man. You Bullshit. You can communicate back home, right? You want, you want her to be there. When you get there, you better. I tell people, flirt. Flirt with your spouse, man. If you don't, somebody will and you'll lose them. We're all like, oh, 89 to 90% of suicides are after, you know, family dispute while on alcohol or drugs. If we could take that away and learn about how to better manage our relationships, which is which is what we do. And then self-awareness. You know, we, we have tear ducts for a reason. 
It's biologically there for a reason. And if you feel like crying, like suppressing it, <laughs> no, I'm fine. If you have to suppress it, you're going out of your way to do something your body needs to do. If we could just pause for a minute and consider that. I'm, I'm holding back from what my body's trying to do to heal. All right, so that awareness of why is my body doing it? Oh, but I'm told I shouldn't do this, right? So we have to get past that. And I think that's just an educational thing of sit there long enough to just, you know, you see that guy sitting at that table, prove me wrong, debate me, you know, <laughs> boys don't cry, prove me wrong kind of thing. But getting past that, those cultural stigmas that we're, we're all afraid of. So Tom, um, interesting story. Um, you had stated that you try to read the book Black Hawk Down and then you try to watch a movie. You said, hell no, I'm not going there. And, and you know, when did that happen? And now where are you? So are you able to read that book and see that movie or if you haven't already? And the other thing is, um, do people need to go back there and revisit the past? Or they do, do they need to just move on, drive on and, and, and just heal and be healthy and just leave it where it is and just honor it, but uh, detach from it? What are your thoughts? You know, I think, I think you need to visit it. I think you need to mourn if you need to mourn. Right? Um, be angry if that's what you need. I think you need to go through those emotions if, if, if you've suppressed them. And I suppressed mine for a long time. And I've gone through the anger and the hate and the mourning now. I haven't watched Black Hawk Down still. I, I, I actually I keep trying every now and then, but it's too real for me. And it's just I don't want to go there. Just, I mean, I don't think those feelings will ever go away, you know? So when I watch Black Hawk Down, it's like, nope, nope, nope. It's it's not a movie. It's too real. I was on, I walked in my bedroom, and it's the opening scene on the beach. I stop and start watching it, and my wife comes in, I start bawling. You know, so it's one of those things that that when it brings you back to those moments, yeah, it's still there. It's still, it's still painful and hurtful. But writing my own book was so difficult, but so cathartic. At the same time, we tell people journaling, you know, and, I, and my wife kept saying, journaling is so good. I go, you need to change it, baby. You need to tell people to make a checklist, to write notes down. Say journaling, no guy's going to do it. You know, not, not many guys will do it, but I write stuff down. I make lists. And that's what makes me sleep at night, right? Get it out, put it on paper, um, write a book, right? So reading my book out loud for audio was harder. I finally got it down, written it put it on paper, now say it out loud, right? Oh, and by the way, say it over and over again until the guy in the boot's happy. I was bawling during that, talking on stage more and more. I'd start, I used to cry on stage more. It's just, you know, grit my teeth and try to get past it. I didn't do it more. So the more you talk about, the more you dive into whatever happened, um, the more you, it normalizes it. Your body accepts it. You, you, you've been able to grieve it. You know, like relationships, you should grieve relationships lost too as well, just like a, a life lost. But you have to go through that process. So I tell people, the longer you wait, that's how long you'll suffer. I, I've spoken to guys, I've cried with guys who fought at the Battle of the Bulge after a speaking engagement with their grandchildren and their children at the table saying, we never knew grandpa. And he's crying with me saying, I'm going to go tomorrow and talk to somebody. Same thing with a guy from Vietnam. So you can start now. Or you can wait 80 years and then go. <laughs> it's up to you. Seems like a process where you, you know, you've recognized the trigger and you, you're not going to watch that movie, read the book, but it's a process also of catharsis, right? Where you're, you're figuring out through those tears, you know, that suitcase of, of uh, a weight in this, you, you know, you, that the tears make it lighter and lighter for you to carry. But also, you know, um, it's interesting because you you go in and you go into Delta, you do stuff that stuff that millions, I'm I'm not talking thousands, millions of people will never do. And then you're denying your body and you're denying your spirit and you're denying so much to get to be at this level. But now it seems that instead of denying the body and the spirit, is that we're embracing things, right? It seems like that's what you're doing now. Is now yeah. doing things that are healthy for the heart, healthy for the mind, right? Is that am I correct? Absolutely. And that's what we're trying to tell today's current warriors. That's just another tool. Mm -hmm. just owning your, your spirit. Whatever it is to get you to do that, stay holistic. Take care of yourself. Put your oxygen mask on first. 
service members will, will go around the world and do things for people that hate them, that they had never met and they'll never meet, yet they won't take care of themselves. They literally are, they're the, we're the last people we think about when we take mm -hmm. other people. Um, and yet we can't really help other people when we're suffering so much, you know, even though we keep trying and we think we can, we really can't when we're suffering as much. So the more help we get for ourselves, A, the more you're able to share with others, more experience for you. Hey, this worked for me. I did this and they, we'll try it with you, you know, and, and oh, by the way, share my experiences, share what I've been taught. And, and that works, but uh, it's just that mix. And I'll, I'll keep trying, you know, I keep trying different meditations. You know, people are like, hey, you want to go do the mushroom thing down in Peru? I'm like, well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fun, but, you know, I have to do a little more research on that. <laughs> you know, things like, uh, you know, whatever, the, the Stella shot I'm going to get or, or mm -hmm. you know, different techniques. I'll try anything out there that, that's that's healthy for you that's not drinking that's not bringing more you know punishment to your body so brian uh go ahead and tell uh, our listeners uh, viewers um what your organization offers and um a little bit more about it and um what's the next step for someone who's watching now or will be watching yeah. on youtube Absolutely. So Operation RSF partners with gym communities across the country. Uh, say across the country, we actually have one current partner in Australia as well. Uh, but really what these people have pledged to do is they take education from us on how physical fitness and mental health are connected. Um, and what we do when people come to us needing a good fitness space to get involved with, we help refer them to our partners. Uh, we also have an individual uh, challenge program where we help people turn intense into habit for living an active lifestyle. Um, they sign up for either a four or 10 week challenge program. We assign them an accountability partner and it really helps take a lot of the, uh, the fear and kind of intimidation out of taking their initial steps into fitness when you have somebody there that's helping take you through the process. We can't necessarily do it for them, but we try to set the conditions up to where they have the greatest chance of success uh, as possible. And then ideally at the end of one of these programs, if they're in a location that is where one of our partner gyms are at, they can get set up there and we kind of help take care of that initial journey into fitness for them. Um, outside of that, we're starting up more community events in 2021. Really couldn't do that last year with a global pandemic and whatnot. <laughs> but uh, now as we're moving forward, we're having more events where we're trying to bring people out, uh, do a physical fitness event together, then afterwards have a real serious discussion about mental health, breaking the stigma, how it relates to physical fitness, and really just try to help build that community. So that's what's next for us. Killer, sweet. Tom, uh, tell us about um, you and Jen and what you guys are doing right now, and maybe a little bit about your book and uh, what's the next step for you in 2021? Yeah, I mean, we had the same thing Brian had in, in you know 2020. We had eight retreats scheduled. So All Secure Foundation, we help, we, we help veterans and their, and their families recover from what we now call occupational stress injury since we like to heal injuries, right? But we don't like the word disorder. So we're trying to change that stigma. We help them through individual counseling via phone, Zoom or person to person. Um, we do couples retreats this year. So far we're at four scheduled. We're kind of holding that and see what happens. You know, we don't want to lose any money trying to schedule things and then turn them back off for COVID again. But right now we have four scheduled and we do resiliency training where we go from base to base and talk to the active duty soldiers about what to expect in their careers. Um, 2021, we've got some online courses we're getting ready to release. It should hopefully within the first quarter, which doesn't give us much time to get them out. But we switched to online courses last year to filming and, and dedicating our time to filming those. So it's more counseling of Jen and I going through different things that'll help other people watch these videos and go through it as well. And we're pushing out to do more resiliency training this year as well with either Zooms or face-to-face, -face, depending on um, COVID. And my book, All Secure, obviously is just about my life and what I went through and how I got better in the end. And then my wife just finished her book and it releases tomorrow. It comes out oh, tomorrow. Wow. Arsenal of Hope. It's kind, of kind of a continuation of my book. Like, hey, here's what we do now. And it's it's, it's, it's a storytelling kind of thing, but it's actually a kind of a self-help book, if you will, like a how to um, tackle PTSD with you and your spouse together. 
I'm going to have to review that. So I, I'm going to put that on my to read list. Uh, definitely going to read your book. So fantastic. Um, guys, thank you for coming on. Uh, and I appreciate you guys have a lot of bandwidth and you reach a lot of people and you, you, you have the experience. And so you're speaking from, um, you know, a knowledge base that a lot of us don't have. Um, and that's something a lot of people need to hear because there are people who are, are crying for help and they just don't know how. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, this, um, you know, YouTube uh, will reach people and that someone will pick up a phone or do something or talk to someone. But uh, thanks for coming on. Um, and hopefully we can do this again. So uh, just have a great day and we'll, we will talk to you guys soon, man. Hey, thanks, yeah, I appreciate you, Mike. Right. Thanks, care, bro. Guys. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.